a lot of kids who come up doing hip hop are doing so with the only tools that they have. So if all we have is records, in comes Cool Herc and Grandmaster Flash and Grandfather and all those dudes and we're making do with what we have. So we take these turntables and they become our instruments. To me, aside from jazz, you know, it's the last true American art form, hip hop. I had the bravado that I could make this movie anyway. I couldn't, I couldn't make it for 30,000, I had 30,000. I could have made it that way. So I didn't have to compromise, I didn't have to take any steps backwards. I had bravado when I walked into people's office. And when they look at this script, well, you know, we don't like this, and can you change the third act, and can you put in a lady in it, well, you know, all that stuff. I was like, well, you know, I can't. You know, this is the movie I want to make, and I can make it over here this way, so thank you very much, but no thank you. That kind of thought process, that kind of bravado, actually helped the movie get made. When you stop asking permission and start just taking destiny in your own hands, things kind of fall into place like that. That's right. The people don't come because you grandiose motherfuckers don't play shit that they like. If you played the shit that they like, then the people would come. Simple as that. So. Who was your favorite hip hop artist in the 90s? The Wu Tang Clan? A tribe called Quest? What about your favorite film? Pulp Fiction? Don't you hate that? Hate what? Uncomfortable silences. Fargo? We stop at pancakes, us. What are you nuts? We had pancakes for breakfast. Okay. What about today? Who is your favorite hip hop artist? Maybe Drake, Childish Gambino, Kanye, Travis Scott? How about your favorite film, John Wick? Maybe The Avengers? What's your analysis of, or your thought on current state of cinema? <laughs> it makes the 80s look fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy. Dude. As terrible as the 80s was. During the 1980s, hip hop's major stars only gradually came to have an impact in the mainstream towards the end of the decade. Thinking of a master plan, cause ain't nothing but sweat inside my hand. Got it back, cause I'm brown, and not the other color, so police think they have the authority to kill a minority. During this time, Hollywood had just seen itself go through a transition period. The 70s were the decade for punk rock filmmaking, creating authors like Scorsese, De Palma, and Coppola. All three were friends, however, two of the other friends, Spielberg and Lucas, were more intent on creating high concept projects. Their sensibilities created a drive for studios wanting bigger pictures with bigger box office receipts. And then in 1978, when a new, young, exciting filmmaker called Michael Camino hit the scene with his beautiful, contemplative hit, The Deer Hunter, starring Robert De Niro. Christopher Walken and Mel Streep. The studios were bending over backways to give the Oscar winning director the keys to Hollywood. His follow up movie, Heaven's Gate, was a critical and commercial bomb. It single handedly bankrupt a studio. It is, to date, one of the biggest flops in Hollywood history. George read another title. This is really a screwball film. This was intended, though, to be an important film that said something to show us that the West was built upon more than just Indian blood, that it's in the nature of corporate America to run roughshod over the working class. Well, unfortunately, we get those points in about the first 20 minutes of Heaven's Gate, and for the next two hours, we have to suffer through one boring and sometimes laughable conversation after another. First of all, uh -huh. this is the most unpleasant movie to look at that I can remember. Not only do you get all the dust that we saw in that scene, yes. But in other scenes, you have smoke, you have fog, mm -hmm. you cannot see the people. I think this is just a, an example of what can go wrong when you try to build a grand scale movie and forget, for me at least, that the characters are all important. They've spent too much money on the props, not enough time on writing characters who are going to walk in front of the props. And it effectively ended Hollywood's obsession with the auteur directors, preferring instead to focus on studio controlled blockbuster hits. The same could be said for punk music, whilst initially an underground sound starting out about the same time as auteur filmmakers of the 70s. I am an anti I, I won't be It eventually died out, and bands like The Clash became more commercial. <laughs>
The late 70s were also when disco music, a hugely popular genre of the early to mid 70s, was officially killed off. The general public had had enough of disco music and on the 12th of July 1979, they decided to blow up a crate of disco music. 50,000 people, the largest crowd of the season, showed up at Chicago's Comiskey Park for the twinite doubleheader between the White Sox and the Detroit Tigers. 15,000 others had to be turned away. Many had come for Disco Demolition Night, a promotional gimmick. Between games, as planned, a huge box containing thousands of disco records was blown up. Yeah! Ironically, this is also the same year that hip-hop had its first major hit, with the explosive song Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang. Sugar Hill Gang! Two years later, in 1981, August the 1st, MTV had just played their first ever music video with the broadcast of Video Killed the Radio Star by The Buggles. Music and film had just gone through its most experimental decade to arrive in the 80s, where experimentation was replaced with commercialism. Everything was pulled into its whirlwind. Any problems? Tenant, is there a six foot back in Gotham City? Nice outfit. I love you. I know. I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> You're fired! Thank you. Long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, the Star Wars saga began, and Kenner continues the excitement. It's the three. Oh, you off. Wait till they get a load of me. No, it's who. Battle against crime never ends, and now you can bring the action home. I'd buy that for a dollar. It, it occurred to me, having watched MTV over the last few months, um, that it's it, it's got it's a solid enterprise, with it, and it's got a lot going for it. I'm just floored by the fact that there's so many, so few black artists featured on it. Why is that? I think that we're trying to move in that direction. We want to play artists that seem to be doing music that fits into what we want to play for MTV. There's th the company is thinking in terms of narrow casting. That's evident. Um, it's evident in the fact that the only few black artists that one does see are on about 2.30 in the morning or, on, or to around 6. If you're new here, please do subscribe. Please do like the video. And to everyone who's done that before or done it already, I really do appreciate all the love and support. It means an awful lot and it allows me to keep on making these videos for you. Yeah, so the idea of a project was to, it was like a, a, a stopgap, like until you got yourself together. That, that was the dream that was sold. Here, come to these low income houses and then you can live here a couple years and you get yourself together, you pull yourself up and then you can move to some home and then you have the American dream. Growing up here and seeing my man that lived upstairs getting killed and then my brother shot, like, you know what I'm saying? That showed me what type of world this shit is, you know what I'm saying? 1989, a whole decade on from the commercial hit of Rapper's Delight, its title in itself a non-threatening one. We had the song Fight the Power, a call to arms by the rap group Public Enemy. Things were changing. Fight the power! Fight the power! The song itself was conceived at the request of director Spike Lee, who sought a musical theme for his 1989 film, Do the Right Thing. Come about, did you call them, they call you, how did they work out? I called them and uh, this is really the first rap record I've ever had in a film. And I, want, I needed a song that was going to be like an anthem. This song, Fight the Powers, is in the movie, Do the Right Thing, like 13, 14 times. And it had to be an angry song and I think this film is going to be the anthem this summer. Lee himself had made one of the first independent films of the 1980s. With a surprise hit, she's got to have it. Made for just $175,000 from grants, loans, and Lee's own credit cards, 
Lee in himself was one of the first pioneers of raising funds for your own movie, using whatever legal methods were possible. His call to fight the power, a constant theme of his work, was apt. And using the thriving popularity of hip-hop music was just as apt. The song itself uses a technique called looping, sampling tracks from the dramatics, Sly and the Family Stone, and James Brown's Funky Drama. This song is one of the most frequently sampled rhythmic breaks in hip hop history. A 20 second drum loop that would go on to be sampled by over 1,300 songs from Public Enemy to the Beastie Boys to Britney Spears to Ed Sheeran. In the same year, another independent feature by the name of Sex, Lies and Videotapes had propelled its director and cast to new heights, winning at Sundance and at Cannes, unprecedented for an American independent feature film. The director, just 26 at the time, and the youngest winner of the Palme d'Or, went on to do some pretty big things. Why do this? Why not do it? From the Academy Award winning director of Traffic and Aaron Brockovich. Because the house takes you. Unless when that perfect hand comes along, you bet big and then you take the house. I've been practicing this speech a little bit. Did I rush it? Felt like I rushed it. That was good. It. I liked it. Ocean's Eleven. How surprised were you when Sex and Lies got selected for Cannes in 89? Very, and I'll tell you why. Um, it's another example of the kind of weird luck that I've had. We were supposed to be in the director's fortnight. There was a Dennis Hopper film called Backtrack that was supposed to be in competition that pulled out at the last moment. And the competition sort of stole us from the director's fortnight. And, and our, we were told our French distributor was told in, you know, pretty clear terms, uh, we're kind of, this is unusual, we like this film, but you should be aware it's not really going to make much of an impression at the festival. You know, don't, don't get too excited. Then two weeks before the festival started, Francis Coppola decided not to be the head of the jury and when Vim Vendors was chosen to be the head of the jury, and Vim turned out to be a big supporter of the film. So in, a, in, a, in about a four to six week period, we went from being in director's fortnight, Francis Coppola head of the jury, to being in competition, Vim Vendors head of the jury, and suddenly everything changes. 1989, 10 years on from disco being blown up and Rappers the Night being a major hit. A decade of commercialized music in Hollywood. We finally had Yo MTV Raps. Yo, what's up? This is Fab Five Freddy, and I'm chilling right here by FDR Drive. Yo, we just got this hype video in for MWA. Yo, they're gonna like this one. Y'all better check it out. And coming up right now, Stir Bass. Black music was finally getting some airtime on a popular music channel. And we had pockets of small, independent films getting success, including. 1984's Stranger Than Paradise, made for just $100,000 by Jim Jumrus. Huge hit at the time. And then we had the 90s. The 90s were the melting pot we needed. Pop exploded. A Tribe Called Quest, a hip hop group consisting of rappers Q-Tip, Ali, Shahid, Muhammad, Jerobi White and Fife Dog were at the forefront of the revolution of hip hop. Put the banner, the weight of hip hop on their shoulders, you know what I'm saying? And personally, I feel like that's wrong for everybody to do. Just because Snoop Dogg and Tupac had incidents which we don't even know, you know what I'm saying, because you can't believe everything the media says all the time. We don't even know how it really actually went. 
You know what I'm saying? All of a sudden, all of hip hop is to blame. All of hip hop is to suffer because they're human beings. You got politicians that are doing crimes that are greater than what they do. That are affecting nations. You know what I'm saying? That are affecting. They have. They committing genocide. You know what I'm saying? Fife in particular consistently delivering some of the best verses in hip hop history. Microphone check, one, two, what is this? The five foot assassin with the rough neck business. I float like gravity, never had a cavity. Got more rhymes than the one that's got family. To be commercial was no longer cool, hip or in. Being on the fringes, being independent, raising your own funds, writing your own scripts, producing your own beats in your basement was now the thing to do. It wasn't just a necessity, it was a thing that was considered to be cool. Having a story, a tale about how you raised a budget for your small independent feature film became the cool and hip thing. Rappers became actors. It was Will Smith, Mark Wahlberg, RZA, Ice Cube, Ice T. Directors, as they had always done, but now more so, were sampling other directors, just like rappers sampled 70s and 80s songs. Tarantino, an avid fan of hip-hop and blaxploitation movies from the 70s, made himself the king of this technique. When Pulp Fiction dropped on the scene in 1994, it spawned various copycat movies, all sampling Pulp Fiction. We had a full circle. Two of the biggest proponents of independent cinema in the 90s were Spike Lee and Tarantino, both huge hip hop fans, both very much auteurs. Instead of calling you like a filmmaker, you're more like a, a hip hop artist. Cause uh, you sample all these different yeah. genres mm -hmm. and you come out with something completely new and different and engaging. Both very much in the get up and get it done mindset. Both eventually in opposition to each other. Has Spike Lee seen your movie yet? Uh, I don't think so. You gonna show it to him, set up a project? Well, I ain't gonna show it, no, all right. <laughs> that little guy's gotta buy a ticket. I'm not gonna see it. I'm not seeing it. I think for me, the only thing I'm say is it'd be disrespectful to my ancestors. But that's a topic for another day. The studios in the 90s were being dominated by the independent scene. The problematic Miramax were the driving force behind the rise in success of independent films in the 90s. And just like all great eras, it was about to fall. Studios began to get a lot wiser to the game and they started creating smaller companies within the larger companies and then creating independent films. So much so that independent films were slowly phased out. And the same for hip hop. Whilst hip hop was never really truly independent, the big record labels were always releasing the music. They slowly turned the true raw sound of hip hop into pop. So much so that by the late 90s, the pop charts were saturated by watered down hip hop and crossover songs. Even pioneers of the underground sound, Wu-Tang, tried their hands at a pop song. Jim Jarrus' Way of the Samurai was almost a point at which independent hip hop and independent films were perfectly bound together. RZA, the mammoth producer of the Wu-Tang Clan, would make the soundtrack. A seminal point in the craft of both art forms. RZA would also go on to star in the director's Cigarettes and Coffee. And you're RZA, AKA. And then in 2003, Tarantino would use the RZA to produce the soundtrack to his revenge flick, Kill Bill. Oh, Hip hop, it seemed, was now a split between artists self releasing underground boom bap hits and pop hip hop. Nas's underground debut, Illmatic, in 1994, featuring production from Quest's Q-Tip, was one of the most important hip hop albums ever made. By 2006, just 12 years later, Nas was declaring hip hop is dead. Blaming watered down commercial hip hop artists 
for the demise. I wake, I put an extended clip in body of all day. Roller every station, wreck the DJ. Roller every station, wreck the DJ. If hip hop should die before I wake, I load an ex. Now, 17 years later, whilst artists both in film and hip hop have the ability to self release their own work, even easier than before, add into the idea of content. You still want people to be film directors, not content providers. No, yeah, the content means it's sub you're something you eat and you throw away. <laughs> content is like, you know, uh, it's candy. I, I don't know what content, it's madness to think you're making content. It would seem that whilst independent films and music are at a peak never seen before, conversely, hip hop and cinema is dead. Well, so what happened was, um, the DVD was a huge part of our business, of our revenue stream. And technology has just made that uh, obsolete. And so the movies that, that we used to make, you could afford to not make all of your money when it played in the theater, because you knew you had the DVD coming behind the release. And six months later, you'd get all, you know, a whole nother chunk. It would be like reopening the movie almost. And when that went away, that changed the type of movies that we could make. People are getting all these songs for free. Now the music industry, like any other industry, has a certain quota of business it does every year. Like every other industry, right? Whether it's $4 billion a year or $5 billion a year, it's an industry of a group of people and that's their yearly quota. So if Napster comes, right, and, and, and he takes all these songs where all these people who are waiting for their publishing checks, waiting for their economics to be created from music, now there's no publishing check. All the numbers are now decreased because there's no physical sale of your music for us to accumulate a value to send you a check. But then at the end of the day, after he does that, he gets a billion dollars. So now you're talking what belongs to, let's say, say there's a thousand artists that's worth value as far as, you know, that sell records that you could, say, accumulate money, right? So we took, a, we took the power of a thousand and put it in one man's hand, okay? So that's one of the first mistakes as an industry we make. And then the second mistake we make is that now there's services going and there's illegal downloads and people won't pay a dollar for the record. Right. Right? And for an album, you won't pay 10 to $12 for an album. Even let's say it was $20, you won't pay that. But you'll pay $300, $400 for your headphones, right. two, $300 for your iPod or your phone, and you use it for music. Let me to me, aside from jazz, you know, it's the last true American art form, hip hop. If you're new here, please do subscribe, please do like the video. And to everyone who's done that before, or have done it already, I really do appreciate all the love and support. It means an awful lot and it allows me to keep on making these videos for you.